I, uh, I made a promise to Tammy a long time ago that every year I would get my blood work. Just, just to check. I've done it since I was like 40, so, you know, like the last 10 years. <laughs> Thought I'd sneak that by if I said it fast enough, see? And every year I'm terrified. Uh, not, not of the needle in the blood work. That's, that, I'm afraid I, I'm going to be found to be diabetic. Because I can't figure out how I'm not diabetic. I mean, a well-balanced breakfast is, is a cinnamon donut and a Coke, as far as I'm concerned. That's, that's a breakfast of champions. If, if you've got a candy bar chaser, even better. I pour sugar into my body at levels that's just how I am not a diabetic. I'm a walking miracle. I can't figure out how I'm not a diabetic. So every year when I get my blood work, I'm always afraid the party's over. Uh, the, the, our, our doctor is a personal friend, so he always calls me the blood work, and I always say, how's the sugar? He sa- and he knows, you know, that I, I'm not disciplined. He says, you got another year. It's still, still good. About, about five years ago, uh, you know, blood work stuff, it's alphabet soup. Your ABC, your, your XYZ, whatever, your ABC's off. And so about five years ago, he said, well, your ABC came in a little high. And I said, well, what's that mean? He said, well, it's a cholesterol count. He said, it's not, it's not serious. Uh, I, I've already called Walgreens. You, you get a prescription, you take one pill before you go to bed every night, you should take care of it. So for the last five years, I, I've been taking a pill. And so now when I, when, when I get my blood work, I, I say, how's, how's my sugar? He says, it's still good. How's my cholesterol? I've added, I've added that to the conversation. And the last five years or so, he said, you know that I, I've already called Walgreens. You got a year's worth of, of refills. Super. I, everything's good. I know the date because I was on my way. I'm part of a mentor group of guys that, that I work with in Michigan. I was on the road to Michigan, February 1st. And he called. He said, you know, your annual blood work got the results. I said, okay. My sugar's okay. He said, yeah, came out fine. I'm thinking, getting a cookie. <laughs> I said, the cholesterol, he said, I've already called your prescription and you're golden. You're right where you ought to be. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of prepared to hang up and say, oh, yeah, I'll give you some blood next year. Here we go. He said, one more thing, one more thing popped up. And, you know, it's all alphabet soup. He said, your, your PSA spiked. Now, that means nothing to me. And I'm thinking, well, another, another pill. I, I, uh, I, my body's changing. I'm getting older. Something else has got, got, got to get rectified. by. What. So, I, so I, you know, I said, so another prescription. I take two pills before I go to bed. He said, no, I'm, I'm going to have to refer you to a, a urologist. And I said, well, what is a PSA? He said, well, it's an indicant of cancer. When he said, I think you have cancer, it's amazing how nothing else was important. I, 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 I never saw cancer coming. I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in good health. And, and Lord knows I look great. And I'm thinking, I, I have to tell Tammy I, I have cancer. And I said, so you're saying I have cancer? He said, no, I am not saying that. He said, don't, don't go around. Not. He said, I, the PSA is an indicant. You need a biopsy. It, it's prostate cancer. And so I... I at this, at this two-day mentoring time, I was worthless. Those guys should have got their money back. It was worthless. Because all I could think about was, I have cancer, and I need to talk to Tammy about it. I came home, and we, we made a decision. I, I, hear me. I go to Porter all the time seeing you guys. I love Porter. The efficiencies out of this world, they're really good. So I, I, This is not for that reason. But for somehow, I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm an hour away from Northwestern. I, I think I want to go to Northwestern. So I got in right away. And uh, the guy was really outstanding. I mean, they're great up there. He answered every question, did, 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 did an exam, checked the blood work again, did another blood work. He said, here's, here's the honest issue. He said, your PSA count has always been four. Now, that's kind of high for a man, but it's not dangerous. And as long as it stays four, nobody cares. This year, for some reason, it went to 10. And he said, that's, that's not good. That, that does make us very suspicious. Now, it doesn't confirm anything. The biopsy will confirm one way or the other. But it doesn't confirm in stone that you have cancer. But wait to be nervous. The guy said, Let, let's talk about the surgeries related to p- prostate cancer. I'm thinking, this guy's already prepping me for surgery. He thinks, he thinks 4 to 10 means I'm... So I, I did the wrong thing. Part of it, Northwestern's fabulous, but you've got to wait your turn. From the time I found out that my PSA was bad to my biopsy was 10 weeks. That's too long. I had 10 weeks to think, which meant I had 10 weeks to go online. Don't go online. So first thing I found out was uh, there's no symptoms. Because I, I felt like, hey, I feel great. There's no symptoms, no, no warnings. It just happens in, in men at a certain age. It, it's common. And there's a 3% mortality rate, which in a way is good, but I'm thinking somebody makes up that 3%. 
And my wonderful friend, Pastor Kankakee First, just died and it began with prostate cancer. That got into my head. So for the last 10 weeks, I've been hiding it from you. You're saying, gee, the last 10 Sundays, I mean, all during Lent and all, all the way back to the beginning of February, you, you've been up. You've been smiling. You've been shake, shaking hands, hug, hugging people, welcoming them. And this was in your heart. You hit it. I'm that good. I'm, I'm that good. And, and I, I tell you, the series that Sean did for Lent, flat out, was incredible. It was great. Sure. But since you and I are just talking, I was on board, but for a, a, a real, real, real parts of it, I didn't hear them. Because my mind and emotions were crying out loud, I got cancer. When you believe you have cancer, even though it's not confirmed, but everybody thinks you do, it affects, it, you go to sleep falling, you, 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 you go to sleep thinking about it, you wake up thinking about it. I, I just couldn't wrap my head around crying out loud. I deal with people. I, I go calling on people. I hold their hand. I, I'm the one with, with cancer? I finally got the biopsy. Uh, and he said, w we'll have the results pretty quick, a couple days. We'll text you. And I thought, well, that's personal. And, uh, you know, when, when the phone clicked off and it said Northwestern, it's scary opening, opening that, that text because I thought, this is all or nothing, because he's already told me what the surgery is, and that didn't sound like fun at all. And also, had it spread? Am I in real danger? So I, I, I tapped to open the text and, and read it, and it said, uh, no cancer cells found! <laughs> this is the happy dance. I'm not done. Oh my, the relief. But you're saying, well, so why are you telling us? Because I had, I had a little bit of an epiphany at, at, this, at this terrible, I mean, a terrible journey. One thing that hit me, when it comes to something going on in my life, if I want to, I could hide it from you. Because I'm really good. And it hit me, I'm going to bet the ranch you're really good. And I wondered... You know, I, I kind of put the mask on that, that kind of let everybody feel like, well, I'm good. Everything's good. I'm fine. It, it made me kind of wonder how many are in our worship and you've got the mask on because you're really good at it too. To where you're making everybody around you feel like, you know, everything's fine when down deep inside you are dying and bleeding. That scared me. Because I realized as good as I was, because nobody knew. Now, if I was going to have to have surgery, I would have told you, of course, because I, I wanted your prayers. But until I knew things for sure, there was no need to tell you. So I, I did hide it. But it scared me. Because I thought, I bet a lot of people here have mastered that mask of I'm really okay. And the second epiphany I had was, it, it hit me. You know, when, when you're wondering if you have cancer, and, and four to ten does give you that feel, and the doctors were incredibly encouraging. They all kind of felt like until the proof came that I should prepare myself for the, this cancer surgery. And then I thought, well, well, what if it spread? And I thought of my friend Ed Heck, and I, 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 I admit it, I, I became very pessimistic. I prayed for peace that I didn't do that well. When you're in that situation, you begin to think big picture. You begin to think about what, what's really important, what's, li what's life and death to me. And you know what I discovered? The things that I were convinced are really important aren't. So many things were a big deal to me in life and death in the big picture. They're not important, which caused me to go to another area. So therefore, what's important? Life and death, important stuff. I narrowed it down to three. Obviously, number one is my relationship with Christ. That's, you lean on that. That's life and death important. Secondly, it's kind of, you probably see coming also, my home, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my kids and their spouses and my grandkids, and I'm so pleased how wonderful all that is, that there's no strife and all that. And I praised God for that part, of, that part that I put in that column of clearly important, life and death important, big picture, cancer important. The third thing that hit me is really important, this. If you're up against the wall, it's amazing how I drew back to us, the church, worshiping together. You know, we're not here just because it's Sunday. This, at some point, may be some of the most important moments of your life. The chance that we had to come together as a tribe, followers of believers, and worship together. 
this ended up in that column that was reserved for only life and death important. Let's prepare to worship. Father, we come before you and we pray for your presence and power. I pray for that person today that is really good at hiding and they have the mask that all is well when it's not. May this be a day when masks fall. In your holy name, amen. Sherlock Holmes has been training Watson. Every time he goes to a crime scene, he's saying, Watson, what do you see? What are the clues? And he went, Watson misses stuff. Sherlock Holmes berates him every time. Here's what you missed. Here's what you missed. That was obvious. After three or four of these trips, Watson's hurting. And their relationship's beginning to, beginning to splinter. Sherlock Holmes senses it. And he says, Mr. Holmes, I, our relationship is changing. I've been too hard on you. Let's go away. Me and you, no work, no, no clues. Let's just go camping. We'll get a tent. Let's go overnight and two friends spend time together. Watson was thrilled. So they go camping. 3 a.m., the darkest of the night, Sherlock Holmes wakes up Watson and says, Look up. Tell me the clues. Tell me what you see. Watson's furious. He can't believe. I thought we were going to do it, just me and you together. Now i got to come up with clues to what I see. But what Sherlock Holmes doesn't know, Watson's an astronomer. He knows everything. And he launches. Okay, okay, here you go. I see a thousand stars, and, and they're twinkling, and, and they're actually balls of gas. And the reason they're twinkling is they come through our hemisphere. He talked about the hemisphere, all the chemicals that make up the hemisphere. He talked about the, the, the moving of the earth, and we see stars in the northern hemisphere that they don't see in, in the southern hemisphere. And beyond those stars, there's a million other stars, all doing the same thing. He talks about galaxies. He talked about how our earth goes around the sun. He, he talked about, about dark, dark, dark holes and black, ma black matter. And he went into everything. He talked for 20 minutes covered everything you could possibly think of, really leaving nothing for Sherlock Holmes. And then in his aggravation, he said, okay, Mr. Holmes, you look up. Tell me what you see. And Sherlock Holmes said, Mr. Watson, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> that can be us sometimes. We will get into the deep, and I, I love the deep. I love deep theology. I, again, I thought Lent was incredible. It was so deep and so relevant and so powerful. Sean took you into deep theology. Sometimes I take you into deep theology. I love going way deep. Sometimes we got to say, but the tent's right in front of our face. If you're in the mood for something really deep, you're taking the day off because today's pretty light. But it's the tent's right in front of our face. And it's the tent that I feel is the mask that I just went through. Someone here is discouraged. Someone here is defeated, hiding behind the mask. And right now Satan uses that. Let me ask you this. How can you fulfill God's very best for you if you live defeated? Hiding under the mask that everything's really fine. I don't want to get off the subject, but let's, let's get in the Word. A key verse here. The last book of the Old Testament. The last words before Jesus. It's a prophecy about Jesus. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. Let's build off this. But for you who honor me, goodness will shine on you like the sun with healing in his wings. Now, healing in his wings has got to be understood. Because that's the core. That's slang. Back then, your role, if you were an important person, you had a robe that signified it. The high priest had a very particular robe. If you went to a town, you didn't have to go, oh, is that the high priest? He's wearing the robe. You knew he was the high priest. Teachers also had a very particular garb, a particular robe. That's why when Jesus would go into towns, they didn't know who he was, but they still referred to him as teacher. Well, how did they know he was a teacher? He wore the robe of a teacher. And on the teacher robe had tassels that, that stuck out a long way. And if the wind was blowing just right, they would flap just like wings. And so the slang of the day was the teacher's robe had wings. So when he's talking about there's healing, even in, in his wings, he's saying if you could just grab a hold of the tassel, the hem, if you could just grab the wing, there would be healing even there. That's how powerful he was. Now this was exactly fulfilled. Jesus is walking in a crowd. And they're, they're, everybody's touching him. He, he's being mauled almost. And in, in this mob of people touching him, Jesus turns to his followers, his disciples. He says, hold it. Someone just touched me. The disciples go, yeah, everybody. Which one? And the disciples go, Jesus, teacher, come on. Look around. Everybody's touching you. How, how do we know? But Jesus realized someone had touched the tassel. Someone touched the hem. And healing happened. I, I want you to see the whole thing. Mark chapter 5, verses 24 to 33. Here's the story I just gave you. A large crowd followed Jesus, pushed very close to him. Among them was a woman who had been bleeding for 20 years. Can you believe that? She'd suffered very much from many doctors. Doctors, all of them, one after another, tried to figure out what it was. So she spent all the money she had. 
Instead of improving, she kept getting worse. There was no Northwestern back then. When the woman heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched the hem of his coat, the tassel, his wing. She thought, if I could just touch the hem of his clothes, I will be healed. Instantly, the blood stopped, and she felt in her body she was healed from her disease. At once, Jesus felt power go from him. So he turned in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? His followers, the disciples, said, Lord, how many people are pushing against you? And he asked, you touched me? But Jesus continued looking to see who had touched him. The woman, knowing she'd been healed, came and fell at Jesus' feet. This woman is nothing more than the exact fulfillment of prophecy that Malachi talked about. Healing in his wings. Every single prophecy of Jesus, of the Messiah, has got to be fulfilled. And that's, what ha- what, that's what's happening. This is even, this is healing in his wings. This is even, even part of our culture. It's in our Christmas carols. Did you ever notice the third verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Hail the heavenly prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Rising with healing in his wings. It's even there. I danced and I sang for you today. Aren't you glad? <laughs> this is one you don't want to miss, campers. And now you're saying, Gene, don't ever dance again. And please, don't ever sing again. But even healing in his wings, it, it's, part of, it's part of our songs. Just to touch the hassle, the tassel. Some need healing. Emotionally damaged in our past. You cannot live victoriously if you're personally defeated. I think we get damaged by other people. Somebody somewhere has been an expert in your life. They told you where you did it wrong. You have failed. You're always going to be a failure. They predict. They just assume you're going to be a failure. Satan loves to attack you with your self-image. He loves to down us. It's a button we can push. You begin to have any spiritual success. You begin to grow. And it's like this emergency button Satan can push. And all of a sudden you're a failure again. Remember, the Bible calls him evil. It never calls Satan stupid. Soon we begin to live down to expectations. We're never victorious. We begin to believe what we cannot do. We emotionally degree. I can't is the life of the defeated. If your first thought is I can't, no matter what it is, you won't. No matter where Christ leads you. It's an epidemic in our churches today. We talk about living kingdom where God receives glory. How can he receive glory if I live feeling like a failure? How can he receive glory if I believe what I do next probably isn't going to work out good? Satan loves to tell you what you cannot do. He will use others to damage you. He'll use your past events to damage you until you don't feel valued or valuable. Sean had a line I wrote down because I thought that's really a cool line. I'm giving him the credit. He says, God's address is at the end of your rope. Uh, That's a lot of truth there. Keep that in your mind, the tassel. Let's go forward. I'm going to jump around, but bear with me. My son, uh, Jonathan, and his wife, Crystal, and and our grandsons live in Alaska. He's military stationed in Alaska. And you're thinking, ooh, who punished him? The opposite. He begged to go there. He's a military mountaineer, teacher survival. He's, he's Tammy's kid. He's, I, I don't get it. But he, he loves it. He loves Alaska. He always wanted to go there. He's finishing his military career there. And, he, the, and we, we've gone so many times up there to be with them and our grandkids. The base is incredible. It's swimming pools, ski lifts. I can see why guys want to go there. But he said, Dad, you have to understand, while I'm in Alaska, technically by the Army, I'm already deployed which means they cannot deploy me anywhere else around the world because I'm already deployed. And I don't want to be gone a year from my, from my boys at this stage in their life. All of a sudden, I'm in love with Alaska. So because of that, Tammy and I, all of our vacations tend to be Alaska for year after year after year because we want to be with our, we have our family. And I've learned so much about Alaska because I go so much. It's, it's gorgeous. It, it, it's massive. But their culture is different from us, radically different. You're saying, but Gene, we get that. In the United States, we're all a bunch of different cultures. The culture around Harvard is probably different than, than, than Mississippi. Not better, not worse, but certainly different. So we get different cultures. You do and you don't. Alaska is a different culture. It's a different world. And every time we've gone, I've gotten more and more into something else with them. And I got plugged in, and this year I learned about the Iditarod. And there's a story within the Iditarod you need to know, but you need to know the Iditarod first. You say, no, no, I already know it. It's a, it's a, it's a dog sled race. They, they, they race in the last... Yeah, it is. But you've got to appreciate it. The history, it goes back to a diphtheria bre- outbreak in Nome. The only way to get way up there was by dog sled, so it honors that. But the race is much longer. They go from Anchorage to Nome. Next year, Nome to Anchorage. Next year, Anchorage, it goes back and forth. The distance is 1,161 miles. Now, I thought, you need a reference. 
So I, I, I Googled, which Google gives me all the answers. I Googled Chicago to Denver. That means you're on a dog sled going through Indiana, Missouri, Kansas, into Colorado. Chicago to Denver is 1,080. So after you get to Denver, you've got 81 more miles to go. It's insane. Even worse, it, it, it starts the first Saturday in March, the coldest time of the year in the Arctic. So it's an endurance race. It's the most in, in, enduring race on Earth. About two-thirds of the teams don't even finish. Every, every dog that finishes, dog sled team that finishes, is a champion. And they have farms that exist just to breed and train these dogs. And it reminds me a lot of ways in horse racing. Number one, the, the huge breeding farms. You ever been in Kentucky? All those unending white picket fences of those gorgeous farms where they raise those thoroughbred horses to race. In Alaska, there, there are these gigantic farms training and raising the, the, the huskies to race. Also, you've seen the championship photo of, of the Kentucky Derby. The horse is there with a ring around, of roses around his neck. The, the official photo has the dog, with the, the lead dog, with a ring around, around his neck. The lead dog's the winner. The wall of champions doesn't list any, doesn't list any human beings. Just the name of the lead dog that, that, that led them to the victory. That, well, that's horse racing. No, I, I, you know, I, I could care less about horse racing. But I've heard of Secretariat. Who rode Secretariat? Some of you may know, but I assure you I do not. During the Depression, there, there was Sea Biscuit. That was a famous horse. Who rode Sea Biscuit? I got nothing. It's the animal that was the champion. The horse won it. In the Iditarod, it's that lead dog is the champion. Also, kind of like horse racing, the betting is incredible. Because what, what it is, they don't run 1,100 miles. They run about an hour to a checkpoint. Then they run another hour to a checkpoint where vets can check the dogs and, and make sure that they're still healthy and, and can, can continue under those conditions. And the vet has the last word. If a, if a dog, is, he feels it's not good, he's gone. Now you're not running with a full team, you're minus the dog. No team's finished with all the dogs. So the betting, they bet who will win, who will come in se second. They'll bet the, the time they come in. They bet what day they'll get pulled. They tell us that on, on this day, this team's not very strong. Day five, the bets are they're going to be gone. I did a files are out there, handicapping everything. The odds of this, I, odds of this. I did a files that study what dog has had to experience. This is a brand new team with a brand new dog. Day four, they're going to get pulled. They'll even bet day four, checkpoint three. They bet everything. It's huge. It's their race. It's their culture up there. And when the race is running from the first Saturday in March on to the next 10, 11 days, life stops. The newscasts at night talk about this, this happened, this happened. This team got pulled at checkpoint number so-and-so because bets are on the line. At sports bars, it's nothing but the Iditarod when the Iditarod's going on. It is an issue of endurance. There are 17 dogs. Eight teams, two each, 16, and the lead dog. So if you pull dogs, that's fine. But if you pull too many, they can't go on, then that team's done. But the lead dog has got to do all 1,161 miles. The lead dog can't be replaced. So that's a special, unique animal. He's the one that's got to get him there. And in the Arctic, in March, the wind chills tend to be negative 70 to negative 90. And it can go all the way to a negative 100. You're saying, yeah, but you can't breathe that in your lungs. You're right. The riders have a special mask and special equipment. Every inch of their skin is covered. The dogs have booties on their feet, on, on their paws or feet. At every checkpoint, th th those boots are changed because they're iced up. And the photos of these dogs and the checkpoints, I mean, before the vets can check them, they got to chip away ice from their mouth and the eyes because any liquid is immediately iced. It's amazing. It just hangs down the icicles from these dogs. You're saying it's cruel. No, these dogs love it. it it's who they are. And the lead dog has got to do it all. Tammy and I had the chance with Alaska. We went to a couple of, the, of these ranches. They're incredible. We, 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 we went to a ranch in Seward, Alaska. We went to another one in Fairbanks. They're huge. And if you pay a little bit more, you can get a ride. They have almost like, like, a, like a hayride wagon with, with, with the wheels and, and the team that they're training. And they'll take you for a ride. And I thought, okay, you know, he's just going to be kind of slow. But the, but the, lead, the, the, the trainer says, okay, hang on tight. And I'm going, yeah, right. It's amazing. You go from zero to 20 now. I mean, my neck got pulled back. I mean, bang, they're off. These dogs are athletes. And at the end, he says, okay, go down and thank the dogs. They want you handling the dogs. It's so much fun because the puppies, they ask you to handle. Because these dogs at every checkpoint, they, they can't be afraid of strangers because vets are going to be there. And they're going to be freezing and panicked. So they have to be used to people. So after our run, we had to go down and love on those dogs. And as you get close to them, you realize these are not dogs. They're athletes with eyes. 
and they are, they are nothing but muscle. They're, fe they're, fed, they're fed a particular high-protein dog food. The training's incredible. So now that you have a basic understanding, let me, let me give you the idea to ride story that, that really meant something to me. We're in, in the middle 1980s, the breeder has a large breed, five puppies. That's, that's large for this breed. And the fifth is a runt. And the fifth is terrible. I mean, terrible. They train them so early. They'll show them a treat and line them up and stand five yards away and say, and they'll let, let them all go at the same time and see who gets there first. Then they'll move, they'll have the treat 20 yards away, then 100 yards away. And they got stopwatches like an NFL training camp checking who's fast, who can fly. They, they monitor everything. They, they have little, 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 almost like wagons, but it's not really a wagon, but a little wagon type thing that they, they load with weights. They want to see what dog knows how to pull, how to pull things, what dog's strong. But this fifth puppy, it's terrible. When they show the treat and they release the dogs, he's still sitting there. You know, I just rubbed my stomach, I'll be okay. Pooling, forget it. He is, and they have defined him as the single worst dog they have ever had. He is a guaranteed failure. He's the worst dog we've ever had. Very shortly, they name the dogs. And they give the dogs names, doggy names, Fido, whatever. But if there's a dog that excels, they'll brand them positively. If there's a dog, the minute they release him, this dog's running. His tail is wagging. He can't wait to run. In any race they have, they know he's going to win. They might name him Bullet. Or there's a dog that, that his tail's wagging when they're doing the, the pulling exercises, and he pulls different things. You put all the weights you want. This dog's in heaven. They might give him a strength name, Zeus or something. So we're naming the dogs, and the owner with the, with the trainer says, okay, that fifth dog, the runt, what's his name? And one of the, one of the trainers said, what about Bagger Ox? The owner is not happy with that because everything's positive here. He, what, he says, Bag of Rocks, we don't name a dog. And I said, excuse me, sir, this is the dumbest dog we've ever had. This is a complete waste of our time. He does nothing. He is dumb as a Bag of Rocks. He's as slow as a Bag of Rocks. Bag of Rocks fits this dog. And all the other trainers are going, absolutely, they're not in their head. And the owner is getting upset. He says, we never do that. Another trainer says, you know, I know you like one, one word names. Cement. Name the dog Cement. Well, there's a bit of an argument, and the owner's the owner, and he's not happy with the negative. But they did win out. They branded the dog Granite. And so we have Granite. Susan Butcher, one of the young trainers, uh, says, I, I'll work with Granite. I, in my free time, we've got to get something out of this dog. Not long after that, the decision's made, who do we cut? Now, they don't put the dogs to sleep. They sell them as pets to get something out of them. But it, it's, a, it's a very strict evaluation. It's this conference room, and, and they bring up such and such, such a dog, and, the, tra and the, the breeders, the trainers will say, this dog excels. No matter what we do, it, it, it blows us out of the water. This could be a lead dog, and that's rare. That's a big deal. So the owner would say, okay, put them with a trainer. Put them with a racer. They know each other's voice. Let them work together up every challenge. Let's find out what he's made of. Other dogs could be a partner dog, not going to be a lead dog. But there's something here. This dog could run in the Iditarod as a partner dog. Now, it's not set in stone. Maybe the dog they feel is the lead dog doesn't excel. He ends up a partner dog. Maybe a partner dog graduates. It, it still can move. They get, he says, okay, what about Granite? And everybody in the room laughs. They say, he's a pet. <laughs> Gotta go. He turns to Susan Butcher and says, Susan, you've been working with him. And Susan says, I love this dog. But the truth is, he's a failure. He'll never be a Diderot dog. He's got to be a great pet for somebody because he loves people. Now, you can't just put the dog in a crate and send him to Susie in Texas. There's a whole process, there's financing and all that stuff, but the dog goes overnight to a vet. The vet's got to sign out the, do the dog's in good health. The vet comes back the next day with the dog and the paperwork and they can continue. The, de the vet came back the next morning, no granite but paperwork. They go in the conference room and the vet says, I'm sorry, the paperwork is to allow me to put granite to sleep. And they're a little stunned because they don't like granite as a dinner rod dog, but these are dog lovers. They, they don't want granite put to sleep. The vet says, this dog has a very rare disease. His siblings don't have it. It's one in a million, but he's the one. And he's going to suffer when he dies. There's no reason for that. And by the way, the reason this dog has failed so terribly everything you've done is because of this disease. He's, he's never had a fair, fair chance. We need, we need to put him down. His chances of survival are slim. That caught Susan Butcher. And Susan said, wait, there's a chance the dog could survive? Yeah, there's a chance. Susan says, I'll take him on. And the vet says, that's, the dog will suffer. Susan is high, high energy, type A. She wins the debate. And the owner says, okay, Susan, we'll let you. Two conditions. Number one, should this dog survive? And the vet's going, should the dog survive? 
He's still a pet, not an Iditarod dog. And we're going to watch this very carefully. We sense this dog is suffering inappropriately. We sense this dog suffering and not going to survive. We're going we're to end it. Susan realized that's the best deal I'm going to get. She took it. Now, skipping chapters in her book, the dog survives. Susan, in 1985, qualifies to run the Iditarod, and they put a team together. Susan, who's the, 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 the writer, gets to choose their team. They have an experienced team because a woman in the Iditarod is a novelty. A head dog, everything experienced. Susan comes in and crosses out the name of the head dog and writes the name Granite. They say, Susan, that's stupid. No, this dog has never been trained. Should have been put to sleep. It's not a lead dog. Susan said, we communicate. I know this dog. He can do it. And by the way, we named this dog Granite as a joke. After what this dog went through, Granite's perfect. He's strong as Granite. The owner comes and says, Susan, you're thinking with your heart, and I understand. You must realize, we get all of our money from sponsors, and they expect us to do well. And they expect us once in a while to give them a win, but at least finish. And if we don't finish, come close to finishing. When you get pulled on the first day, it affects all of us. It affects our income. And when you get pulled with 16 dogs intact, ready to go, and a lead dog that's failed, you're going to be a punchline. Susan is strong. She wins out. And a dog who couldn't even be a pet is now the lead dog in the Iditarod. You're saying, Gene, this is a great story. Granite won. No, Granite got pulled. He failed. Exactly like they said he'd failed. Day one. But it wasn't here to his fault. Toward the end of the day, out of the blue, a moose attacks the team. Moose are mean, my friends. Now, Susan, all of a sudden, is on that radio. Mayday moose attack. They come flying out. It takes them almost a half an hour to get to where they are. In that half an hour, that moose has had its way with those dogs. Those dogs are trying to defend themselves, but they're in harnesses. By the time the vets get there, they can't, they can't dissuade the moose. They shoot and kill the moose. And they shine the lights in the evening. And not to get, I don't want to get gross and specific, but it's a bloodbath. Two of the dogs are declared dead right there. They bring the rest to the checkpoint. Susan's in shock because she's been there watching this massacre of the dogs she's been working with. She's in shock. The vet comes to her and says, okay, here's our situation. Every dog we brought back, all your team dogs, they're going to they're survive. But there'll never be Iditarod dogs. I'm not even sure they can qualify to be pets. Not all rescue dogs are rescuable with what's in, what they've been through tonight. But th that lead dog, the dog you call Granite, we're going to put that one down. Susan pops out of that shock. She is adamant. No, no, no. His name was Granite because of how strong he is. She wins the argument again. Granite is hospitalized. Surgery stitches from here to there. And Granite survives again. 1986, she's back in the race again. Granite as the lead dog. And the bets are now, no bet is allowed. Granite will finish. None. Forget about winning. That's a joke. All the bets are what day he'll get pulled. It's all early. And they're even betting that he'll freak out. That's the number one bet. Now, freaking out, out there, you have to realize, if a dog disobeys, he freaks out. The cold weather, the elements, something got to him. He freaks out and goes the wrong direction. They got to call that in right now and get you. Because you're going 25 miles an hour or so. Two hours, you can be 60 miles out in the middle of nowhere. We don't know where you are. And darkness is coming. It's going to get colder. You get attacked by a moose. It's living death. If, if, they, if this dog disobeys, then they've taken dogs off it because they freaked out. For whatever reason, they didn't obey the master. You don't, and it's not like you can pull those dogs back. you got 16 dogs. They're athletes. They own you. You don't own them. That lead dog has got to take your, your, your directions. And the team, when Susan says, I'm going again, I'm taking granite, and they're saying, you realize, this dog should have been put to sleep twice. On top of all of that, everything we said that was wrong with him is still wrong. And now... Those glaciers up there are always creaking, always making noise in the, in the evening darkness. That dog's going to hear a creak and think it's a moose. He's going to freak out on you. Susan, again, type A battler. Susan wins, and there is Granite leading, leading the way. Gene, the story gets good now. No, Granite freaked out. He freaked out. There's a point where she's pulling him this way, and Granite, boom, 25 miles an hour in the wrong direction at dusk. So she's pulling the radio. They're going to stand in line to say, I told you so. But that's better than dying. She wrote in her journal and then became her book. Something inside of me said, trust Granite. And so she held the reins loosely and said, Granite, take us to the checkpoint. Now, I put myself in those shoes. If I'm going 25 miles an hour at 70 below zero in the wrong direction, 
Would I trust granite? You know what I would do? Mayday! Get me now! You would too. You're awake, aren't you? Somehow, granted, in this convoluted way, got them to the next checkpoint. And they said, we're, we're shocked to see you. And, and we're hours by never. The other dogs are already bedded down in the warming house. The, 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 the riders have already been eaten. Up comes Susan Butcher and Granite. They said, we're, we're shocked. And she said, yeah, we, we came a weird way. They said, yeah, but what about the soft shell? Now, those, those glaciers shift and the snow can come off them, forming what's called a soft shell. It's like quicksand. It's just so soft, so soft with snow. It could be 10 yards, it could be a football field. And the, the path led them right through a, they did a soft shelf. They've been apologizing to everybody. We didn't know the soft shelf was there. It happened just recently. Dogs are wore out there. They go try to get dogs and pull them off. So many teams have been pulled because of fighting their way through the quicksand, fighting their way through the soft shelf. Susan said, we were, we were never on soft shelf. We were on high, hard ice all the way. They got a map out and they realized the point in time where the soft shelf was is the point when granite detoured. And he ran right along the edge of the soft shelf how did he find the checkpoint? I did a file say probably he smelled the other dogs and smelled the food. That's fine. How did he know about the danger? I did a file say we don't know. How that dog knew there was danger and a leader around the soft shelf, we don't know. But he did. In her journal, she wrote, that was the night I found out this is a special dog. And Granite shocked, shocked the Iditarod world leading his team across the finish line. Granite, branded by his name, Granite. Worst dog we ever had, dumbest dog we ever had. Never be a lead dog, never be a team dog. Should have been put to death twice, once as a pet, once with a moose attack. A dog named Granite completed the most grueling race on earth. Never live down to someone else's expectations. Never let anybody define you. Never let anybody tell you what you can't do. Never let anybody brand you as a failure in the future. They are wrong. Satan cannot continue to win at this point. It's the point of our emotions. I will never again have a God vision ruined by what he's calling me to do because I didn't do something right yesterday. That's a button that uses on and it must end. You cannot live victorious if you're defeated. Granite becomes a metaphor for us. It's a true story, but he's a metaphor for us. Something that is absolutely guaranteed to fail, finished. Satan is a dominant weapon calling you a failure. And when he does... You come to church and wear the mask that says, you know, everything's really okay. And I would bawl you out at that point, but I'm guilty there too. 1986, a dog they named Granite. Finish the Iditarod. He'll never be a lead dog, never be a partner dog. Should have been put to sleep twice. Shocked the Iditarod world. Pulled a woman across the finish line. Completed the Iditarod in 1986. 1987, Granite won the Iditarod. 1988. Granite won the Iditarod. 1989, Granite won the Iditarod. First three-time grand champion in the history of the Iditarod. In fact, this dog named Granite is the greatest dog in the history of the Iditarod. Say, so oh, Jane, there you go. Why do pastors do that? You got a nice story here, and you got to put a little, little explanation point. Make it a little bit better. He not only won the races, he's the greatest dog ever. Eugene, back off. Just stick to the facts. The facts are good enough. I, I would agree with you. Except the Iditarod Museum is in Warsilla, Alaska. It's, a, it's what you'd expect. It's not this marble edifice. It's, it's, a log, it's a huge log cabin. But as you come in from the outside, there's a statue of a dog. And it says, in honor of all the great dogs that have completed the most grueling race on earth. Underneath it, a little smaller, the statue is modeled after the greatest Iditarod dog of all time, a dog named Granite. Take a look. You are in the image of Christ. Crying out loud. No one has the right to define you negatively. This is the worst dog we ever had. There's a statue of that dog now. He will never be a lead dog. There's a statue today. He will never be in the Iditarod. Can't even be a partner. Can't even be a pet. Should have been put to death as a puppy. Should have been put to death after the moose attack. There's a statue today. No one has the right to defeat you. Every story's got an epilogue. Let me wrap up with the epilogue. Granite won three in a row. In 1990, I guess he ran again, but the streak ended. He finished, but he didn't won. They retired Granite in 1991. And he went out the way champions go out. He won it again. Let's move up more than a decade. Granite is now dead, of course. 
2004, Susan Butcher is married with two young children. But it's not the Susan that they know. Susan's type A, high energy. You know, she's won all these battles. And Susan's kind of dragging. The, the energy's not there. And her husband says, you know, I think it's an iron deficiency. But get a, get, get a, get a physical. Let's find out what it is because you're not yourself. To their shock, it's leukemia. And the attitude is all across Alaska, they're in shock. But if there's ever been a fighter, it's Susan Butcher, and she gallantly fought, dying August 5th, 2006. The funeral's in Fairbanks. And yes, I did a rod world flocks to Fairbanks. This is the first lady of the Iditarod. This is the heroine of the Iditarod. This is the multiple champion of the Iditarod. The author of the book, Granite and Me. Politicians flock. Bre breeders, owners, trainers, Iditophiles, fans. The photo of the, of the funeral home, they're, wi they're winding around inside and the line is around outside and down the block. They need to be there. They need to show their respect. They need to tell her husband and, and her children what she meant to this great race that's their race. But as they first finally got in the room where she was, and they, they see the husband and the young children and, and the casket, and they, they can kind of get a glimpse of Susan. They begin to cry immediately, but it's reported it's not because of what they saw. It's because of a poster that hung from the ceiling. It's the first win. It's the official photo of 1987. Now remember 85, she ran, the moose ended that. 86, she ran it again, the soft shell. She finished but didn't win. 87 is the first win. She's going to have more wins, but 87 is win number one. And they hung up there the official photo of Susan in the winner's circle. And most of them, when, when they went, had their arms up like this, not Susan's. Susan's holding a dog to her chest. And the dog has roses all around his neck. Susan's not smiling. She's beaming. And they see them together, the greatest team of all time. The picture, they see them together again. Susan clutching granite in the winter circle. When they walked in the funeral home, this is what they saw. Four years later, Susan Butcher is honored by the state of Alaska. The governor at that time, Governor Sarah Palin, signed a bill establishing the first Saturday of every March, which is the beginning of the Iditarod, Susan Butcher Day, and they observe Susan Butcher Day. The bill says, to remember the life of Susan Butcher, an inspiration to Alaskans and millions around the world. At the time of her funeral, though, the newspaper, the Fairbanks Beacon Journal, the editor wrote an editorial that I thought was so powerful when I read it, but the first paragraph says it all. Let me read you the exact paragraph. He wrote, without Susan Butcher, there certainly would have never been a granite. Now, he's referring to what they all knew, that I just told you. Should have been put to sleep as a puppy at the Moose Attack. So without Susan Butcher, there certainly would have never been a granite. But also without granite, would there have been a Susan Butcher? Without granite, could she have just been another racer? But together, the perfect team. Incredible. The two of them found the line marked impossible and crashed through it. I love that line. They found the line marked impossible and crashed through it. The two of them. Does that not scream Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ? I have a partner. I can do all things through Christ. Why on earth am I feeling like a failure? I can do all things through Christ. Find the line marked impossible and crash through it. Satan cannot continue to defeat you at this point. Live in victory or else you live your whole life wearing a mask, pretending everything's okay. If you're, if you're defeated today, bleeding today, defying the wound because there is healing in his wings. Like that woman that bled for 20 years. Maybe for you it's been decades of hurt. You're so used to wearing the mask, it feels normal anymore. All those lies that Satan has used effectively all your life to damage you. There's healing in his wings. If you're here this morning and you're completely defeated, there's healing in his wings. If you're discouraged, there's healing in his wings. If you feel like you've been ambushed, there's healing in his wings. If you feel like you've failed, there's healing in his wings. If you've been embarrassed, there's healing in his wings. If you feel beaten down, there's healing in his wings. If you've sinned, there's healing in his wings. <laughs> Satan begins with a lie and builds momentum from there. Mark chapter 5, a woman discovered healing in his wings. God help us, I urge you never to hide behind a mask again.